Diabetes, hypertension, collagen, vascular diseases, blood disorders, sickle cell anemia, HIV. HIV stuff on here is really old. Um, I realize you need to update this infection. So, blah, blah, blah. I am going to just go to the meat and what's important. Unless you'd like me to go through every slide. I'm going to give me. You want me to? So, you know your types of diabetes, right? Okay. Um, any person with diabetes is at risk for ocular complications. Diabetes affects all tissues of the eyes, all tissues of the body for that matter. It is the leading cause of new blindness. Okay, that's fine. That's the word. Because the the, pro, the the blindness that diabetes causes is permanent. When you lose vision from stuff from diabetes, it tends to be permanent. So anterior segment complications of diabetes. <coughs> it's related to dry eye syndrome, also known as keratin. Uh, Keratoconjunctivitis sicca, dry eyes, keratoconjunctivitis sicca. The tear film volume may be decreased. How many layers of the tear film are there? Three. Um, and you can have decreased corneal sensation related to diabetes. It's just like these people have decreased sensation to the bottoms of their feet. Corneal complications, abrasions, ulcers, recurrent corneal erosions. A recurrent corneal erosion is a abrasion of the cornea that they get over and over and over again. Why? Because the basement membrane is weaker in a diabetic of any tissue than it is in a normal person. So once they tear it, it has a tendency to tear on the same spot. And why? Did, and so this is a patient that would. Um, wake up in the morning with severe pain the minute they open their eyes. So if you put all of that together, they have dry eyes, they sleep, their basement membrane is weaker. As they sleep with their lids closed, the eye dries out, the, kind of, the lid kind of sticks to that spot of the cornea that, that's weaker, and the minute they open their eyes in the morning, they tear it again. It's a very common story, and if you hear that, you know, you might, and you might remember this, that's what's going on. You need to see an ophthalmologist. These people wake up, with pain, can be pretty severe pain, and then in a couple hours it goes away. Um, corneal abrasion, we've been through, right? So fluorescein stains the basement membrane that is exposed when there's an abrasion. So you put the fluorescein on the eye and you shine the cobalt blue light, and that's what you get. And you all have cobalt blue on your direct ophthalmoscopes. scopes. So diabetic cranial neuropathy. neuropathy. These are good, good test questions. So I'll go slowly. So in diabetes, you get ischemic changes. So when you get ischemia to a nerve or brain tissue, that's the equivalent of a stroke. You can have three, four, five, and six. You can have um, nerve palsies of any of those. Five is which? Which does what? Corneal sensation. Yeah, corneal sensation. That's, yeah, so trigeminal. Um, just an aside, the trigeminal in herpes simplex keratitis, those patients have um, decreased corneal sensation. So if you, if I were, wanted to be very academic about it, and I want to know if a person has a herpetic infection, without any anesthesia, you can take a cotton swab and poke them in the eye, and the eye, the eye with the uh, herpes that's been affected by herpes will have less sensation than the other one. They won't feel it as much. Um, so if you affect any of these, except five, five doesn't have a motor component, you'll get double vision, because if you create a stroke or a palsy to one of the nerves, it's going to not work one of the muscles. So one eye is not, when you move in a certain direction, it's not going to go that way, right? So if I have a cranial nerve six palsy on this eye, right, due to diabetes, 
Also, con also um, associated with what? It was on another slide. So I'm talking about cranial nerve six palsy. Oh, that's what? Through? No. The, the systemic wise, there's um, it's associated with diabetes, but there's another disease that we went over that it's the most common nerve palsy to go along with giant cell arteritis. You stroke out that nerve. Um, it's on that. So giant cell arteritis, go back and know everything about. I'll go through the patient a little later. But um, so if I stroke out, if I have a palsy to six on my right eye, what am I not going to be able to do? AB duct. AB duct my right eye, correct. So it, these can be complete <coughs> or partial, meaning I might not be able to move it past the midline, or I might be able to move it a little bit, but not all the way out. So as I look to the right, it's going to go, go, go. This one's going to go here. This one's going to stop here. So this person will have double vision, right, when they go to look in what direction? I'm just kind of getting you guys to think. When, I, when the patient looks in to the right, they're going to start to have double vision at some point when that eye doesn't move. Um, is that a binocular or a monocular double vision? Bin binocular, because the double vision is going to go away no matter, they're still seeing two images, good images, so whatever I cover. So, um, so I'm just trying to get you back to understand those other things. And that's why binocular double vision is a little more concerning because it has more of a systemic impact. If it's giant cell arteritis that's causing that, then you have, you, that's a, can be a big problem for a patient. So cranial nerve three, four, and six palsy, typically they resolve within um, 90 days. So the, where the, I was doing general, but this is talking about when a diabetic has an infarct to one of these nerves due to the diabetes. They get they get ischemic. They're not getting as good a blood supply. So when we can, when I can say that a patient that has double vision due to one of these nerves, if I can call it a diabetic palsy, I just tell them, look, it's going to go away in six weeks, ninety days. Come back. You don't have to do anything else. So most of the time, you can. If a person with diabetes and hypertension comes in with a sixth nerve palsy and there's no other complaints that would, would make me think of something else, I can say, look, this is your diabetes. The, you can have the best diabetic control in the world, but you just got unlucky today. You stroked out that nerve. It'll be back to normal in six weeks. It will. So this, no, okay, so cranial nerve three is the oculomotor nerve, right? has a superior and inferior division. This is important, um, so I'll go through this slowly. I think there's a couple questions. So the oculomotor nerve, this is the most common cranial nerve affected in diabetes. So you get ptosis. I'm, I'm going to talk about a right-sided cranial nerve three palsy. I'm going to get ptosis. I'm going to get a droopy lid because the superior division of three innervates that levator palpebral superioris. So the, the lid's going to droop. Um, right here. I'm going to get altered pupillary reflex. It might be sluggish in response to light. And the eye is going to be down and out. And that doesn't mean that the pupil is abnormal. It just means that it might be a little sluggish. It's going to react normally in a diabetic. I'm going to talk black and white, not gray here. The diabetic is going to have ptosis, a normal pupil. If they ask you, is that pupil sluggish, the answer is yes. But is it normal in size? Yes. And there, we'll go into why that's important. And the eye is down and out. So the eye is under a lid, it's looking down there. Does that make, you know why? You have to think about what nerves, what muscles three, and then draw, make your little, and cross those out, and then the other ones are pulling. So now you have the um, lateral rectus pulling it out, <coughs> and when it's pulling out, you then have the um, superior oblique pulling on it, which, and that will pull, let me think. Um, down and out. No, it's going to be lateral rectus. 
And uh, what's that? Yeah, the period of week. So it's down and out, and the pupil is normal. If a patient comes in and they have diabetes, okay, and they have ptosis, an eye that's down and out, and they have a normal pupil, this is a diabetic third nerve palsy, it will get better in six weeks. They don't need anything else except their diabetes. And the answer is always, you're gonna get better, you need to go have your diabetes checked. Let them see my doctor in six months, we'll go see him next week. So then we go on to, okay, let me just go through this here. I think it's in another slide, yeah. Did you say that the pupil would remain uh, normal? Normal. It wouldn't be dilated at all? Nope. If it's dilated, that's what I'm going to go into right now. So I'm talking black and white. If the, the eye is down and the eye is out, down and out, and ptosis, and you have a mid dilated pupil, the pupil is noticeably larger than the other eye. What you have to worry about is a um, aneurysm at the circle of Willis at a certain junction pressing on the outside of the third nerve. That is an emergency that those people need to get a scan that day, uh, something that looks at the circle of Willis. Right now, the standard of care has always been a um, But these, what? CTA? Actually, these, yes, these days it's a CTA or it's a CT, CTA or an MR, MRA. In the old days it was, um, that's what it is because that's the difference. That's black and white. I mean, no patient is, is really ever black and white, but for test purposes, that's what it is. This is the difference between it's okay to send them home and you're going to the emergency room for some scans in the in the hospital because it's telling you that they've had that aneurysm it's expanding and now it is bumping up against the outside of the third nerve and it's creating this problem if they if that ruptures that's a big issue you know they have cranial bleed and it, uh, higher morta high mortality you ask why because on the third nerve, those fibers that are gonna go to the pupil are on the outside of the nerve. That's where they're traveling. So when you stroke out the nerve from diabetes, it's ischemia within it. Nothing is happening to that fiber that's running on the outside. When you have a mass effect, the first thing that happens is it bumps into those fibers and it causes the pupil to be abnormal. And then it's putting pressure on the nerve and you're getting the palsy. That, that's, is, that's anatomically why. So know that, okay? You got it? So the fibers on the outside are the parasympathetic fibers? Um, yes, because you're knocking out. Yeah, then you get it dilated. That's true. <coughs> That's very important. Know that backwards and forwards. That's never how it goes. They're always, you never can, medical legally, you don't want to hedge. So a lot of times, I'll, um, the patients will get an MR, MRA, or CT, CTA. Maybe not emergently, but the next day, just to make sure. Cranial nerve four superior oblique. It's the thinnest and most fragile, prone to diabetic damage. It gives you vertical diplopia. We've gone through that. Cranial nerve five, ophthalmic division. You get loss of corneal sensation. So when you get loss of sensation, you're at risk for infections. Diabetic keratopathy, which is just an irregular dry surface because they're not blinking as much, kind of like they don't feel the bottoms of their foot. They will get a lateral rectus palsy, which is cranial nerve six. Um, horizontal diplopia, the eye might turn in. That, that's just a function of tug of war. If you knock one out, the other one's still pulling, but really they can't go out in one direction. Diabe diabetics have an increased risk of cataract development. What are the two buzzwords for diabetic cataracts? 
Christmas tree and posterior subcapsular. Not the cortical spoken. I think it was Christmas tree and posterior subcapsular. Diabetic cataracts are generally more visually debilitating than non-diabetic ones, and they can cause bilateral refractive error shifts. Cataracts. Diabetics will have, um, this is how they get diagnosed in the eye doctor. The person comes in, um, everything looks totally normal, but they used to a week ago, they had normal 2020 vision. They went to an optometrist last week. They bring their exam. They don't need um, glasses. Now, all of a sudden, they come in a week later. I'm really blurry, but I can refract them. Now, they're a minus 2, a minus 3, 2020 vision. Everything is fine. The first thing it should be um, is check their blood sugar. That's, what a diabe that's how a diabetic kind of person. Per, um, presents to the eye doctor. Totally normalized and a shift in their refraction. It's because of they have high blood glucose causes um, uh, changes and um, the lens fattens or changes shape causing a refractive error. It's still correct and they're perfect, but it's a it's a refraction that came out of the blue. Check, you, check, you check their blood sugar, it's like 300, 400. And then if you go into all the stuff about diabetes, all of a sudden they're losing weight, they're peeing all the time. But they didn't think it needed to tell you, they just got blurry vision. They're diabetics, so. It's not permanent. Once the blood sugar goes down to normal, it, they'll go back to just uncorrected. Amyotropia 2020. Amyotropia, no need for glasses. 2020, everything's in focus, right? Optic nerve, they, we've been through this. Neovascularization, glaucoma, they have a higher um, incidence of glaucoma. We've been through that. Diabetic retinopathy is due to hyperglycemia and hyperglycemic damage to the small vessels. It's microvascular damage because of the parasites. Do you want me to go through the, the diabetes? What I would suggest is um, go back to the slides that, that, that differentiate between pre-proliferative or non-proliferative and proliferative and know all the characteristics of those. Um, no pictures, just know what they are. Non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, NPDR, also in other places pre-proliferative. Mild to moderate, severe and very severe. Microaneurysms, dot and blot hemorrhages. Different, remember the shapes of the hemorrhages defined by where it is. Hard exudates and macular edema. Clinically significant macular edema, we talked about that. Those are, that's swelling in a certain, um, that, that has certain characteristics anatomically. You don't have to worry about that. Severe NPDR, increase, the, the blood vessels are gonna be more tortuous. There's gonna be more bleeding, the venous beating, cotton wool spots. 40% of these patients will develop proliferative diabetes within, diabetic retinopathy within one year. This is that non-proliferative, some hemorrhages, some exudates, cotton wool spots. Or proliferative diabetic retinopathy, responsible for the most profound visual loss, neovascularization near the optic disc. You can have it elsewhere on the retina, NVD, NVD, on the surface of the iris. That one I didn't mention in class, but that's also NVI. You actually look at the iris and you can see blood vessels on it. That will ultimately cause a certain type of intractable glaucoma because those blood vessels will creep out into that angle and scar off the angle, and there is no treatment for that. Vitreous hemorrhage bleeding into the back of the eye because of all these abnormal blood vessels. They will bleed into the vitreous, and they will get a tractional retinal detachment, which is a type of what type of retinal detachment? 
non-retinitogenous. There has not been a break. Proliferative diabetic retinopathy right here because you're seeing some abnormal blood vessels out in the periphery right here too. That's iris neovascularization, NDI. That's a really bad diabetic. Vitreous hemorrhage. There's the disc, the nerve, the um, blood vessels, and this is all blood. He's been through the treatment. Laser, laser, laser. So symptomatic persons with undiagnosed diabetic diabetes mellitus may complain of blurred vision, fluctuating vision, or double vision. All patients with diabetes must have a comprehensive dilated eye exam every year. And not everybody does. So that, that's important, that might be that every diabetic really needs a one a annual visit, and then the annual visit is kind of depending upon where they are in the whole scheme of things, sometimes we'll see them more, more uh, frequently. Strict glucose control can prevent and slow the progression of diabetes. Hypertension, um, those numbers have changed, I believe, but I will leave that to, to you to know. What is the definition of hypertension? No. 135, right? You it decreased the systolic, what? You just keep getting old numbers and it keeps getting changed. Yeah, I think it's 135 over 80. It might even be lower. Yeah. What? It might even be lower. There. They, made it, really, they made it so almost like everybody's hypertensive. Yeah. <laughs> um, does anybody know the exact number? I'll look it up later. 130 over 80? 130 is pre-hypertension. Oh, so less than 130 is normal. Pre-hypertension. It have to be like in the 120s that have non-normal. The number of adults with high blood pressure increase. Oh. So ocular complications are seen with essential hypertension and secondary hypertension. You understand the difference between those? Essential hypertension, I just got hypertension, I don't know why. Essential hypertension, there's a cause for it. Um, a renal problem or eclampsia during pregnancy or something that is causing the hypertension. So here's the copper wiring that somebody asked about the other day. So two types of retinal disease occur in patients with hypertension. One reflects the changes induced by arterial or thickening. So the, the arteries are getting thicker. Um, and one rep, the other represents the acute vascular injury induced by the hypertension. So let's go through these, and I'll explain how you need to know it. Grades one and two, they, um, they have enhanced prominence of the light reflex as more of the light is reflected from the thickened artery wall, arteriola. The thicker it gets, the more of a light response you're going to have. That's that copper wiring. Um, they have vascular tortuosity and AV crossing. What does that mean? Well, or nicking. In the, in the eye, the blood vessels are all over each other. The arteries lay on top of the veins. If the, the arteries get thicker and heavier, they weigh more on the veins and they create kind of an indentation in the veins. So you get nicking when you call, and that's what's, what's going on. And that creates its own problem because you're decreasing the, um, the venous outflow by compressing those at different areas. So that's why the problem with hypertension. So that's grades one and two. When you get to grades three and four, you're getting copper wiring. So in the first one, you're starting to notice an enhanced light reflex. But when it's called copper and silver wiring appearance, that's in grades three and four, the higher grades. Um, okay, I would go back and know those. Grades one and two, focal and then generalized arterial or constriction that represents the autoregulatory response to prevent both hyperperfusion and intracapillary hypertension. The autoregulatory response becomes impaired with more severe hypertension in the diastolic over 120. 
resulting in the transmission of the increase in pressure to the arterial and capillary circulation. So grade three flame-shaped hemorrhages, fluffy white cotton wool spots, and yellow white exudates. That's pretty straightforward if somebody were to ask you. Grade four, papal edema. So I know the first slide had a lot of stuff. So grade one, not a lot of anything, some thickening of the <coughs> arteries. Grade four, papal edema. The hypertension is so high that the, the nerve is swollen. This is a systemic thing too. So people will present with papal edema due to hypertension, really high blood pressures. You look in, the nerve is swollen on both sides. You go back to grade three, flint hemorrhages, white cotton wool spots, and white edges. I'm giving you the, the simple way to think. If you think the least and the most, three has the very specific thing. Okay, go over those again. Hypertensive retinopathy tends to look just like diabetic retinopathy. Diabetics tend to have hypertension, so it's hard to tell what is what in an eye. You manage the systemic condition of hypertension. The uh, malignant hypertension, when it's really high, you can get optic nerve edema. In all patients with hypertension, you need a yearly eye exam. So collagen vascular diseases or rheumatologic diseases. So rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, which is actually now juvenile idiopathic arthritis, JIA, it's a change name. Systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE, the spondyloarthropathy, giant cell arthritis, Lyme disease, and gout. These are all collagen vascular diseases. You guys know that, right? Yes. So collagen vascular diseases, corneal disease, significant complication in patients with Sjogren's disease, you know what Sjogren's disease is? Dry eye, dry mouth. It's a problem with the mucosa within the body. There are definitions, clinical definitions to Sjogren's, but if you think of it, dry eye, dry mouth, that's a Sjogren's syndrome. Uh, ker keratoconjunctivitis, conjunctivitis sick, I remember I said that's dry eye, it's dry eye, dryness of the conjunctiva and the cornea. In the real world, the sh we're always worried about Sjogren's patients because, I mean in the eye world, when, you, when you're treating dry eyes, a lot of times people just treat dry eyes, they give them artificial tears, come back, but there's, there's, there's reasons for dryness and if you just give somebody artificial tears for dryness and say come back, they're better, but you haven't fixed the problem. There's, there's reasons for dryness. There's either decreased production, there's inflammatory components, there's the lacrimal gland is inflamed. Um, but a true Sjogren's person, and you will see this all the time, and it's a lot of older women. It's more common in women. These patients are the, the women that come in to see you. They sit down and, and their cup of water goes next to them. They go nowhere without water because their mouth is so dry. And it's nice to know when people have Sjogren's because they have other things that go on. They need rheumatologists, they get arthritis. Some of the, one of my mentors, we take care of a ton of Sjogren's because in cornea you do dry eyes. So one question, if you really want to know, it's like a cheap way to diagnose Sjogren's is if I give you a um, saltine cracker and I ask you to chew it up and swallow it without any water, a true Sjogren's patient immediately, absolutely not. They can't, they just can't do it, they're that dry. Um, so the consensus on Sjogren's syndrome, it's, it's, um, Mucosal dryness, dry eyes and dry mouth, which is, and the dry mouth is keratoconjunctivitis sicca, and dry mouth is xerostomia. That's the root technical word. They, you can biopsy the salivary glands and it will have a, um, the pathologist can, looks for certain things with Sjogren's syndrome. 
for the autoantibodies. There's um, SSA, there's a whole bunch of Sjogren's antibodies that you can order on these patients to get um, the diagnosis. There's a new test that you can just test the, the uh, tear film and it will tell you whether they have Sjogren's syndrome or not. It can either be primary or secondary. The most common is secondary, so it's just like essential hypertension and non-essential. Sjogren's syndrome, primary, they just have Sjogren's syndrome. All their labs are Sjogren's positive. They don't have anything else. More commonly, they have some kind of other rheumatologic disease, and the Sjogren's syndrome is secondary to the inflammatory, the most common being rheumatoid arthritis. Tons of rheumatoid patients have dry eye, dry mouth, and secondary Sjogren's syndrome. That's what I see the most of. So no Sjogren's syndrome. Episcleritis, this is an inflammatory process of the episclera, the more superficial surface of the sclera with the blood vessels. It can be a manifestation of rheumatoid arthritis. You guys have great memories. I told you that episcleritis is typically nothing to worry about. It goes and comes can be a manifestation of rheumatoid arthritis. Not usual, but textbook it can be. It's typically acute and onset. They describe pain and redness. It's usually benign and self-limited. That's, that's kind of how I described it earlier. Can it have anything to do with sarcoidoma? Or sar sarcoidosis? Yeah. Scleritis does, that's where I'm gonna oh. go. Episcleritis, it can, but it, for all practi for in practicals, the real world, Episcleritis just happens, it goes away. Scleritis, um, that's episcleritis. Those little corkscrew-like vessels, they're very superficial. They're not scleral vessels. If you numb them up and you took a cotton swab, you could move those blood vessels around. That's episcleritis. So then there's scleritis. And we're talking collagen vascular disease scleritis. It has a more ominous prognosis with respect to ocular morbidity, the, and we're talking about rheumatoid. The incidence in patients with rheumatoid arthritis has ranged from 0.7 to 6.3%, but as many as 33% of all patients presenting to an ophthalmologist with scleritis have associated RA, diagnosed or not. Diffuse anterior scleritis is the most common and least severe form. That means it's kind of all over the, the sclera, diffuse and anterior, in front. Um, it usually responds well to systemic immunosuppressives, oral steroids. So I do quite a bit of collagen vascular disease in the eye and see a lot of scleritis. That's scleritis, that's a bad picture, but the vessels are real thicker and meaner and deeper, and the, these patients don't just describe um, discomfort, they have boring pain, it's really painful. So then we said diffuse anterior scleritis. There's a, let me just do what will be the next most intuitive thing. There is a posterior scleritis. It's on the back side of the retina behind the macula. They get swelling of the retina, they get decreased vision, and they get boring pain in the back. It's very difficult to diagnose. You don't see it up front. Anterior diffused posterior. Now you've got necrotizing scleritis with and without inflammation. Without inflammation, scleromalacia perforans, characterized by severe um, thinning of the sclera in an otherwise uninflamed and painless eye. So it's it's basically the sclera is melting away. And that is it. It's thinning, 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 and then the uvea, the ciliary body and the choroid is poking through. So now all you've got is conjunctiva covering um, the uvea, the choroid, and that's why you get this black and blue. And so that's necrotizing scleritis. The sclera is necrotizing. It's weight, it's melting away. There's no inflammation because that's not really a hot looking eye, and it's also known as scleromalacia perforans. Um, since pa these patients don't typically complain of ocular discomfort, it, it's essential for clinicians taking care of patients with with long-standing rheumatoid arthritis to lift their lids, examine their eyes, rule out any thinning, because remember, it's painless. They don't know that's going on. So 
if you look at my notes, anytime I have a patient that I know has had problems in the past, it always says no. Um, I, I lift up the lids and just have them look down. All my notes will always say no scleritis or no melt, something like that. It's just, for me, it's something that I do. Because if you have a decrepit rheumatic patient kind of on crutches or a wheelchair and they're really bad, these patients can one day all of a sudden you lift their lid and they've got that, pic that picture. And that is so difficult to take care of surgically. So patients with rheumatoid arthritis and scleritis may have more advanced joint disease and extra articular manifestations than those without scleritis. So scleritis is a bad prognostic factor when it goes along with rheumatoid arthritis. Scleritis, particularly the inflammatory necrotizing type, so that would be melting but inflammatory, a hot, red, painful eye, in the patient with rheumatoid arthritis may also reflect underlying systemic vasculitis. So when you have necrotizing scleritis that is inflammatory, that is a very bad prognostic factor. These patients have a higher morbidity. Because of the general increase in disease activity, rheumatoid arthritis patients with scleritis appear to have a higher mortality in the absence of immunosuppressive therapy, meaning untreated. Sickle cell disease. <coughs> red blood cells, we went, kind of went through this, they, they change from healthy round blood to red blood cells to crescent or sickle type uh, red blood cells when they're stressed. Stress can be anything. It's approximately 12% of the population. There's different forms of it. Um, SC is more likely to have um, and that is the type of uh, markers or genetics of it, but more likely have ocular involvement. S-thal, S-thal is seen more likely to have ocular involvement. When you're a um, SS, you don't have, that's true sick, sickle cell disease, you don't have a lot of ocular involvement. Here's the slide to pay attention. What do you get when you have sickle cell? You get intravascular sickling, hemolysis and thrombosis, arteriolar occlusion and capillary non-perfusion that stimulates neovascularization, right? So we're getting non-perfusion, we're gonna get that bad neovascularization, similar to diabetes, but you're getting it from sickle cell. You can get a vitreous hemorrhage and a retinal detachment. Know those things on that slide, put a big asterisk. These are what you salmon patch. These are just the different uh, signs on the eye that you get with sickle cell retinopathy. How do you manage it? They get a yearly exam. Um, they go to see an eye doctor and laser. It's just the same as diabetes, it's the same principle. You're getting like neovascularization and you're treating with laser. HIV, um, HIV there's um, HIV retinopathy. It's all the same stuff as diabetic retinopathy cotton wool spots, little hemorrhages. Um, actually, I'm sorry, it's cotton wool spots. You have, a, you have a HIV patient with cotton wool spots. We define that as HIV retinopathy. If they start to get bleeding, then you start to worry about CMV retinitis, cytomegalovirus retinitis, um, Kaposi's sarcoma affecting the eyelid. You, you don't even see Kaposi's sarcoma anymore because HIV these patients are so well controlled, it just doesn't happen any longer. These were those dermatologic lesions in, in, HIV, in AIDS patients, basically. Um, HIV patients are more prone to get shingles, herpes simplex keratitis, syphilis, toxoplasmosis, uveitis, retinitis, cranial nerve disease. So the non-infectious ocular complications, so this would be HIV retinopathy flame shaped or dot hemorrhages, um, Roth spots and microaneurysms. They get cotton wool spots. That's the most common finding in an HIV retinopathy. Um, so if you have an HIV patient with diabetes and you see a couple of hemorrhages and a couple of cotton wool spots, you don't know whether it's the HIV or the diabetes. It's a similar appearance. 
that could be a diabetic, but that's in an, in an HIV positive patient. That's HIV retinopathy. CMV retinitis is the thing that you worry about when you have an HIV patient on, on your service or if you're C1 clinic, they're complaining of really bad vision loss. You have to worry about reactivation of, CM, of cytomegalovirus in the retina. It's the most common, dairy, common secondary infection in AIDS patients. Uh, it's the most common visual cause of visual loss. It's a pizza catch a pizza and pie in the sky, similar to um, kind of a brand uh, central retinal vein inclusion. You treat it with the medications, so it's getting all this bleeding and CMV retinitis. Um, they consult ophthalmology a ton with HIV patients and blurry vision, but what I learned in residency was the first that these patients don't really get CMV retinitis unless their CD4 counts like less than 50. So after like 30 consults, you know, then as a resident you start to learn do they have, what's their CD4 count, if it's good, then you go see them a day or two later, most of the time they get discharged from the hospital. These patients are so well controlled these days on the medications that you just don't see a lot of these complications any longer. But they're all good test questions. Herpes simplex virus can cause keratitis, blepharitis, conjunctivitis, and retinitis. Blepharitis is of the lids. You can get like um, lesions of the lids. Know that line. Herpes zoster virus, you can get keratitis, uveitis, chorioretinitis, uveitis. Syphilis uh, is related to neurosyphilis. And um, you can get candida, the fungus retinitis. Know that slide. Read the, the things that you can get. It's all still true for HIV patients. And, and it's good to know that it's not just the eye, but in general. That's a Kaposi sarcoma of the eye. I've never seen a sarco Kaposi sarcoma of the skin or the eye or anything. And I did my internship out in Northern California and when it wasn't that great control, but I just never saw it. Sorry. Um, <laughs> management, yearly eye exams for any patient with HIV, referral to an ophthalmologist, um, CMV screening. No, that's slide. Okay, that's it. I would say that the systemic disease uh, slides and what I pointed out as important would be something I would review a lot. Um, just quite a few questions. But a lot of it you know from other parts of it, but that's where it kind of puts it together. Like the diabetes, you, you knew everything and then there was just more there. So with that in mind, I've got a little bit more of a review. Do you want to take a couple minutes? Like, no? Um, any questions as to what we did today? It's very organized. We did it at 5.30 this morning, what? No. <laughs> um, anything, any questions on cranial nerve three palsy? That's important. That's important for real life. That's one of the things I think it's important for the test. It's important in real life. Differentiating between the two. It's the pupil that gives it away. A normal pupil, diabetes, they go home, it's better in 90 days, it said. If the pupil is involved, then you worry about a uh, aneurysm of the circle of Willis. <coughs> Hypertension, I, I kind of guided you through, know the different stages, a little bit more about hypertension. It's important because it's so common. Rheumatoid arthritis and, the, and then scleritis is important because it has more, anything that affects mortality has morbidity is important. Scleritis is one of those things that when people get it, there's increased mortality and morbidity. Sickle cell, I showed you HIV. Um, multiple sclerosis, MS, that whole thing with the steroids and all that, you got that? 
Optic neuritis is common to MS. It's a common presenting thing and a high percentage, I think it's 40%, I can't remember exactly the slide, go back and look at it. We'll get an optic neuritis. Optic neuritis has two types, papillitis, retrobulbar optic neuritis. It's important because we really know how to treat it. The visual field defect with respect to the horizontal meridian. You give them oral steroids and send them home. No. You're either going to send them home and tell them their vision is going to be fine in six months, or you're going to put them in the hospital and give them three days of IV followed by 10 to 12 days of oral and tell them it's going to be the same. The one thing you don't do is give them oral steroids. Why? Because that increases their chances of getting clinically significant MS. So that, that would be the one thing you, you can that can be a mistake. That's why that's important to stress that. So no steroids. No steroids is fine. They're going to be the same in six months as if you put them in the hospital, give them three days of IV followed by oral. If you give them just oral, a prescription for 14 days of oral and send them home, you've, you've increased their risk of going on to develop clinically significant MS. Remember, the presenting, just because somebody presents with optic neuritis doesn't mean they have MS. You have to have two neurologic events separated by 24 hours. So just because optic neuritis doesn't mean that it was no. MS, they were going to develop MS. Diabetes, look over all the slides, you guys must have that. These things can up with that. Bacterial conjunctivitis. Um, go through in any slide you see on conjunctivitis. Um, pay attention to, we did dry eyes get sicker. So conjunctivitis, bacterial conjunctivitis, look at the causes, know that it typically, it's not, practically speaking, it's not common. So when you're out in the real world, if they have an eye that, that has some pus on it, or like, remember we saw that chlamydia gonorrhea eye with tons of pus, that bacterial conjunctivitis. If there's, if, if there's no pus, it's probably not bacterial conjunctivitis. Um, then you worry about pink eye or viral conjunctivitis and allergic conjunctivitis. So. The difference is bacterial tends to be one eye, have some mucus or purulent discharge. Then you have allergic and viral. Both have a lot of tearing, both have itching. Allergic tends to be both eyes. Uh, viral tends to be one eye, and then it progresses to the other eye. Um, Allergic, we treat with antihistamine, allergy drops, antihistamine drops or the different drops out there. Viral conjunctivitis, just it's a lot of hygiene and artificial tears. Um, in the eye doctor's office, we will give people steroid drops because it will make them feel better more quickly. The problem is, is when you take them off the steroid drops, they can come back and recur. So I'm not advising you to use steroids, but you'll see it every day, it's fine. Um, people just get feeling better more quickly. When people go to the doctor of any sort, they want medications, they want to feel better more quickly, so we do what they want and we give them steroids. But it also gets people back, back to work more quickly. <coughs> Cranial nerve three and all the ocular, so no what nerves innervate what and what the muscles do in primary gaze or the primary let me go over that the primary um what it does primarily motion getting tired just a quick question about the viral conjunctivitis um if you give a steroid in like pink eye extremely contagious for seven to ten days Give a steroid, does that reduce the contagion? They're still contagious, okay. yes. So, and you have to be pretty vigilant. I mean, if you're going to tell somebody they have pink eye, <clears throat> you've got to find out what they do and make a decision whether they go back to work. If they're sitting at a desk in a cubicle, it's okay. Just They're not going to tour if they give it to the office. But if they work at the hospital, and you don't tell them not to go back to work, and they give it to a whole floor, that's a problem, and everybody wants to go back to work, but you really have to, don't let them talk you out of it when you really, restaurants, 
hospitals, um, pharmacies, all of that. Pink eyes, if you, if you, you know, just think about how many prescriptions a pharmacist or a technician hands out every day. If they have pink eye and they're doing this all day long, you have 30, 40, 50 older people with conjunctivitis coming back and unhappy. So you keep them out of work for a week. But that's a great question because just because I'm putting them on steroids doesn't make them less contagious. Absolutely. And viral preauricular pre lymph node. On anybody that I think has viral, you just kind of palpate here, you're going to feel the lymph node a lot of times. That's where the eye drains, the preauricular. The anatomy of the eye and where the light is going, all that, you've got to know that. If there are photos on it, they're simple. Giant cell arteritis, real important. You want me to go through that? You do? So giant cell arteritis is a white person, not a black person. Black people typically don't get giant cell arteritis. It's an older person. Um, they complain of a headache. They complain of weight loss, fever, kind of a prodrome jaw claudication when they're chewing, they, they feel pain, scalp tenderness. Um, you ask them where the headache is, they do this. Then you, gotta, then you stop, just take time, you can't get out of the room, you gotta document. And then what do we test? We order an ESR, an erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and a CRP, a C-reactive protein stat. You check on it later. If they're abnormal, um, then the gold standard is a temporal artery biopsy to show, but you also, they also get treated with steroids. Once you put them on high dose steroids, you've protected them from vision loss. I'm typically dealing with them um, when somebody has raised the question of vision loss. So then I, I have a low threshold to put them on steroids. But if you're just worried about giant cell arteritis, you can order the lab stats, see them back the next day. But, uh, but if you're concerned, it's weekend, start them on high dose steroids. Not a little bit, 60 milligram, one milligram per kilogram, call it. Um, don't be afraid to put people on. If you're concerned that there's something that's going on and people really need steroids and you're concerned, put them on a lot of steroids. You're better off, you'll take them off a couple days later. And this is one of the, the things that you know we can treat. Does it affect the biopsy at all? If you start them on Friday and they don't go for the biopsy till Tuesday, um, biopsy no labs yes. yes. They want, you, want, you want them to get the labs prior to starting, but no, not not the the um, when we do temporary artery biopsies, the pathologists can see it. They don't ever see it anyway. Who does that? The temporary artery biopsy. Yeah, uh, I do surgeon. ophthalmologists or vascular surgeons. So, but it takes time. There's not. A, the reimbursement's terrible for a, you know, for a temporary biopsy. The vascular surgeons take them to the hospital, they have the ultrasound, they do it quickly. Um, retinal detachments, you guys know giant cell, we just went through the, all the retinal artery and vein occlusions, know those, because those are important. And pretty much I'm going through everything, right? <laughs> you got amaurosis fugax, it's important. Because they get a they get a carotid workup echo. You're looking for atherosclerosis. Um, so anything that's considered an ocular emergency, there's not a ton, but I would go back and look. So that would be giant cell arteritis, central retinal artery occlusion, <coughs> acute angle closure, glaucoma. Retinal detachment, that cranial nerve three palsy, differentiating between the two. If you get to the point where you're not sure and you're, or you know, you don't want to just write diabetic third nerve and send them home, because it might catch up with you one day, that becomes an urgency. You can't treat that real lightly. Um, they do need that imaging fairly quickly just to rule it out. Once you once you've ruled it out, then they go home and see back in six weeks. Um, Hyphema, hypopion. Hyphema is blood in the anterior chamber. Hypopion is uh, white blood cells in the anterior chamber. 
in the world of ophthalmology, the corneal abrasions, the corneal infections, keratitis, um, glaucoma, macular degeneration, those are important. Go back and read those slides. Just read them again. Understand what what is glaucoma. There's a couple. There's two different types. How do you treat it? Um, as far as the medications, know the different types and. Um, I would say learn the colors. Don't learn the, the brand names, but learn the colors because I've seen it on the test before. But more importantly, it'll help you when you're dealing with older people. You, you might feel kind of understand it a little more. We went through P's today and I kind of told you what's important in there. That's it. If you just listed out what I just talked about and you go through and you know that, that's a lot. That's not a little. Because I didn't give you what's on the test. I'm just pointing out the slides. It, that'll take you a lot of time. But if you go through and do that again, you'll be fine. Nobody ever does poorly on this test. <laughs> Don't be the first. <laughs> that's why they bring me back. <laughs> Are there any questions? You got my email, right? Dr. Ginsburg at gmail.com. Spell it out and email me with any questions. You're tested when? Next year, Friday? Wednesday or Friday. Friday. And if anybody ever wants to come spend time in my clinic, it's fine. Just if you can eat. email me and no problem. Yeah, thank you.